Yeah, let's see. Oh, okay, it must be me. I'm going to be very hear. candid with you. A theme song. We are living I can in hear a theme song. computer. Pro okay, weird. Yeah. I'm going to have to try to. I might have to try yeah. to reboot. I'll be back. All good. Yeah, the theme song just started and just stopped. Oh. Ah, there we go. There we go. <laughs> you can hear me now, yeah. bro? Yeah, I can hear you. I guess I don't know. You know, some things sometimes every it's like the rule always is as soon as you're about to start an event, everything goes wrong. So it's sort of oh, sort of the totally. usual. Totally. Yeah, nothing unusual, just like you know, fires going off, alarms, <laughs> you know, the usual. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um you're uh you're uh you're all ready to go. You're you're uh looks like you're yeah. walking around the let old me get apartment. Re yeah, let me get reseated and um yeah, um, I guess you want to do another audio slate. Uh sure, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah um, let's how, see. I, if I if you're slate on your end, then I guess I should slate on my end. Yeah, hey, it might help else. out. Or because if I, I I I didn't know quite because if I if you slate it doesn't sync to anything right except so it doesn't seem to um doesn't seem to help me yeah, maybe I just haven't figured oh, out oh how it doesn't to pick it up my clap over the over the mic not over my mic it does over yours ah. I but you know all what? the slate needs to be captured on all of the sound devices yeah. at the same yeah all time. devices. But it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't work unless we all do it simultaneously. So I think it's okay because uh, I just sync it up. It's it's no big deal. All right, cool. Yeah. Whatever helps. <laughs> yeah. Um, there we go. So yeah, I'll just hit record and I'm good. Cool. Great. Okay, I'm recording uh, the video. I am recording on my Zoom. And uh, we'll just dive dive right into it. All right. Let me All right. Get my hands back. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. I'm ready when you are. Okay, let's do it. Let's let's dive into dive into the song. Dive into it. This I'm going to be very Come candid with you. with you. Here we go. Here we we are living in a computer program reality. 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 Reality.
Welcome everyone to Simulation Nation, your portal to all things virtual. I'm your host, Graham Tallman, and I'm here to keep you informed about all that's happening in virtual reality. We record our episodes live in Altspace every week. You can join us from your PCR VR headset. Just log into Altspace, join our Simulation Nation channel, and teleport in. Today, we have a game review of DBO. You have the metal to survive a monster-infested dungeon crawler that immerses players in the classic fantasy RPG genre like never before? Time to find out. We will break it down, have a healthy dose of tips and tricks, and give it our wow score. Joining me once again is the most futury of all the futurists, Futurosity. Here he is. Hello, hello. Thank you so much for inviting me back to Simulation Nation. Are you kidding? You're, like, you're, you're on the capital of the wise already. We, we have to do a, an official uh, ceremony where we can I induct uh, you into the council of the wise. Where you get, Ooh, get... <laughs> where you get so many perks. You you become a king oh. of the metaverse. Oh, wonderful! I got a like a little sword tap on both shoulders. Hopefully, <laughs> exactly. I just think, awesome. By the way, I realized I realized I totally doxed you last time, and I said your real name. Do you want me to call <laughs> you by your real name or by your new newfangled metaverse name, Futurosity? Well, it's totally fine. Um, I essentially think of my Twitter account almost like a public telephone inside the barber shop. So if someone wants to reach out to me. Hey, you can reach out via Twitter. So that's totally fine. Jonathan Boyce or Futurosity, totally cool. All right, all right, excellent. Well, you have to create a new Twitter account that's just your Futurosity uh, pseudonymous uh, identity, right? I mean, I guess, I don't know. Maybe, maybe, or maybe you have like such a huge Twitter follower with Jonathan Boyce that you don't want to uh, migrate them over <laughs> or something. <laughs> I think Futurosity will have more fans than my normal self. <laughs> well. Hey, anytime you want to make the transition, and I'll just go back into the old episodes, and it'll be like, and welcome, my new guest, Beep! Beep. <laughs> Oh, that's great. perfect. Have the lip sync yeah. not match, you know, that'll be perfect. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, totally, uh, totally excited you could come back, because we've been both geeking out on uh, uh, all over the, the week, and actually for a couple of weeks now, on Demio, which I always thought was called Demio until I listened to a podcast with the create the the CEO of Resolution Games and he called it Demio. So I guess uh -huh. it's like a demon. It's like a demon, but it's like like a demon song, Cheerio Demio. I don't know. So oh, you know what it actually Demio. is? Demio yeah. comes from Latin. Um wow. it's a term meaning to like to go below or down into the depths. Um uh, so yeah, it's supposed to be like a you know a, a metaphor for dungeon crawling. Ah, so if if only I had known we had a Latin scholar here, we could have had this. Uh, <laughs> well, beforehand. at least ninth awesome. grade to eleventh grade. <laughs> that is so great, I love it. Okay, cool. Well, um, yeah. So obviously, so the the great thing about Demio is that it's a multiplayer. You have a you can have as many as four players playing, and we've played a couple games uh, as uh, as teammates. So it's been super great. Um, again, you're like, you know, you're on the West Coast, I'm in Hawaii, so we're kind of like meeting in the metaverse and playing this game in these dungeons and trying to do all this crazy stuff, and it's been super fun. So um, did you want to start with the overall thoughts, just sort of uh, what do you think about it? What do you, you know, sort of the big picture stuff? Oh, well, please. Um, it brings me back. Um, Demio made me feel like an eight-year-old all over again playing games you know especially in the late 80s um you know dungeons and dragons or hero quest um that's the one game this reminds me of the most um hero quest mm -hmm. was a dungeon building game where you had this dark dungeon you kind of get your friends to crawl through it as you know basic archetypes like you know the sorcerer or the warrior um mm -hmm. very similar kind of themes you know using miniatures to go through various traps and scares um so it really reminded me of those early scares as a kid you know i roll the dice right. there's something behind this door that's going to come out and get us and demio recreated that experience it that role-playing game experience of just throwing dice with four, three other friends have a chance to have a laugh and hey kill some goblins while you're at it <laughs> really enjoyable totally. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I, you know, the weird thing is, I was totally into fantasy, and I was totally into video games, and I never played Dungeons and Dragons as a kid, and I don't know why ah. we didn't get together and play it. I, I would play like Final Fantasy on like the original Nintendo, and that was Ooh. like you have four, 
four fantasy characters, like one sort of soldier, one uh, wizard, and you go through the worlds. And I, I remember loving that game so much. And you stop and you talk to things and you, you have certain cards that you use spells and all of that. I think Final Fantasy is at like what? Final Fantasy 10 now or, or something like that? Oh, it, it's beyond 10. I, it's in the yeah. teens, I think. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, uh, so that was that was my only. Uh, I, I feel like I missed out on '80s nostalgia ah. gaming with Dungeons and Dragons. Um, having said that, it doesn't affect my love of this game at all. Like, I totally get the vibe that they're going for. I totally um, know what that experience was all about, and the fact that it's in a rec room, like an '80s rec oh, room, yeah. is is a really cool kind of throwback. Um, and you know it's the 80s because there's like a ColecoVision or something on the ground, <laughs> and like a Commodore 64 or something like that. Um, oh, I loved it. Yeah. But, it's the ambiance of the I, 80s. You know, what's that? Oh, this is the ambiance of the 80s. It just felt yeah. like a throwback, you know, and someone's downstairs in the basement playing some games, friends. Yeah. So I, I feel like um, even though I, I missed out on my Dungeons and Dragons youth in that specific way, it doesn't change my love for the game. When I first got the game, I opened it up, uh, put it put on the headset, and I was like, okay, I'm just going to go in for an hour just to test it out. <laughs> and when I got out, I realized I had been in there for four hours and like was just like totally immersed. And just like lost track of time and was just kind of like in those dungeons. Because I have to admit, at the beginning, when you first get in there, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of uh, explosions and, and and spells and plasmas flying at you. And and it's it's a it's a it's a it's a, it just seems so chaotic and so hectic that I really found it challenging. And I wanted to like up my game very quickly. Um, and the and the way that I found that I upped my game the most was actually to play with other players, right? It's like that you go oh, into yeah. the multiplayer mode, join a game, and then suddenly this guy's like, oh, you just got to do this. Or, oh, you got to aim for that guy because he can spawn those guys. And then it, uh, bit by bit, step by step, it becomes much more clear uh, as to what you have to do. And now, which is a couple weeks later, I can go in and, and pretty much finish the game any try i i do my now my goal is like don't ever let one of your characters down you know like mm, can you yes, make it yes. all the way through without downing anyone so that's sort of the new challenge but i i, I totally loved it totally immersed um and i thought it was i thought it was just a, yeah it's just a great a great um a great vr game so um yeah, you know, we'll get into uh, we'll get into the, some of the things that maybe could have been improved. Like, for example, the fact that I say I can beat it every time. There's only three levels. Yes, that is an issue. But I give it that I give them this. It's a board game, so when it comes to content, you know, you have a game like you know Hero Quest or even like Settlers of Catan. Uh, essentially you kind of create the adventure over and over again um, through the unique experience of having three other players with you. So that's the hard part where it feels like a board game, but I, I want a little bit more. You know, I, I, I wish there was at least six levels, you know, something a little meatier or even something that we could split up into more than one session, you know, especially if it's a group of friends. It's like, hey, why don't we do two games, you know, and complete like a, a six hour mission over two or three sessions. Uh, I, those are certain features I wish would come in the near future. Overall, it's just a wonderful experience, very immersive. And it, it just reminded me of just being a child. I mean, I think that's the thing, picking up those miniatures and you could literally flip the miniature over and look under it. And there's more information. It actually says, you know, uh, made in Sweden. Uh, I mean, I, just those little details are just brilliant. So, um, so I apologize. My headset is having trouble. I didn't hear anything that you said. All I saw, but I saw your mouth was moving, so I didn't want to interrupt you for the audio. <laughs> That's all good. All good. <laughs> what well, I'm, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna have to figure me, out what to do here with the audio. I don't know why it keeps doing that. Um, you know, would you mind if I rebooted one more time because then it's it's gonna mess up. Are you you did such a great job with your audio last time? It was so easy to edit. And if I have my headset uh, giving audio, I mess up the edit. Do you oh, mind that's if all I good. Try, if I reboot real quick one more time, I'll be right here. Okay. If it happens, 
I'll just have to take more time in the editing process. But let me let me try this one more time here. All good. I'll be right here for you. All right, I'm back. <laughs> ah, greetings. <laughs> so what happened last time was that I was turning up the volume on my headset, so I'm not going to touch the volume on my headset, and hopefully that solves the problem. We'll see. Oh. I have no All idea good. what happened there. Yeah. Um, did you want to recap what you said, or should we? Oh, yeah, yeah. Just, just yeah. to be safe, no trouble. Yeah. Well, overall, just my overall thoughts and feelings, um, it's a nostalgia fest. Um, and I'm a total mark for this kind of game because I, I grew up with this. I mean, watching right. Stranger Things and seeing the kids, you know, try to hunt down the Demogorgon in their basement brought me back. And this game was the physical and virtual manifestation of all those quality games I had growing up. So overall, I found it to be wonderful. You know, the, picking up the dice felt real. Picking up my miniatures felt real. And the fact that I could change my perspective, get nice and close, and just have literally the game on my lap. Uh, something was so comfortable about that, having the game on my lap and moving miniatures. I'm, I'm a huge miniature gamer in the real world as well. I'm, I'm a big oh, Warhammer nice. Fantasy and Warhammer 40K huh. fan, so I build and paint miniatures. So seeing the digital virtual miniatures I, I, I almost made me want to you know, just go full in virtual. I mean, I could spend so much time playing this game. It's very replayable. Even though the content is a little light, um, those three hours go by so fast. I mean, you could do it a few times over. Yeah, it was that. So, so yeah, that's where I, that's where I uh, left you uh, left off with you was when I was like, "There's only three levels." <laughs> did you? Yeah. Did you, yeah. Did you have a response to that, or were you just? Uh... Yeah. Well, when it comes to three levels, I think of it in terms of it's a board game made virtual. So there are certain design limitations that seems like were intentional um, mm -hmm. because they wanted to create you know, a board game, rolling dice and killing things game. Um, it's not really a story game. I mean, there's a little right. bit of story, um, right. but overall it, it felt like, yeah, it's a little light on content, but the hopes for the future of content, um, just looking at um, resolution games, um, their Twitter account and YouTube, it looks like they do plan on many updates coming this summer. So with the hopes of that, um, I, I'm, I don't mind the three levels at this point, because I know more's coming. Right. Totally. I'm so super excited about that. I guess they've they've announced these the next level is the, or the next campaign is the realm of the rat king. Oh, which, wonderful. Yeah. And I, I thought I wonder if there was a hint because when you're in the playroom at the beginning, there's a poster on the wall that says the night of the were rat as though that's like a movie that you could watch. I wonder if the were rat is like related to the rat king. I guess we'll find out. 
Oh yeah, there's a little metaverse going on. I mean, that little room seems like there's little Easter eggs, just like you said earlier. You know, there's like some Commodore-looking computer and old movie posters, and you know, look like some kind of yeah, Coleco Vision of some sort. I mean, it's a hodgepodge of the best of the '80s in that room. Um, absolutely love that little room. Yeah, exactly. I know you have an option to hide it. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, wait, what did you say? There's actually an option to hide the actual room, but it feels a little weird because you're just like floating in dark space. Uh, yeah. um, I, I actually enjoy having the room. Um, even if the option of other rooms in the future will be great, um, you know, taverns or other fantasy-like elements, but hey, yeah. nothing's better than the 80s. Can't complain. Yeah, no, I you're right. I think I may have by accident one time turned everything dark and I was like freaked out. Like, what the hell? I'm in a, yeah. I'm in a void. I'm in a bottomless, endless <laughs> void. I got to get back to like the room. It's nice and safe. Um, oh, yeah. But, but you, <laughs> you sort of touched on plot. So yeah, the plot is extremely thin. So I think so. there's a, some interesting things that may be, uh, I, I was a little bit questioning about the plot as well. Okay, so the plot, basically is that you are in the black sarcophagus, right? That's what this um, campaign is called. And basically yes. there's this elven king, uh, right? Who was mad, I guess. And then he was, he locked himself in a sarcophagus and his spirit got trapped between two worlds. So he was not living or dead. And then he made a pact with darkness, with the outer darkness, which like, what is the outer darkness? Like, what is that just like evil spirits or like sort of vague enough that it could be something? I'm not sure. Do you have any hints or clues as to what the outer darkness might be? I'm not sure, but I'm imagining something humongous and scary in a future <laughs> campaign. Uh, it feels right. like uh, hopefully they're going to build up. Um, I really hope that the campaign will build into some bigger bad, you know, because right now our big bad is that... um. You know, we have a queen of sorts, some elven queen, but I mean, there's yeah. many different monsters that are possible. So who knows? I can't wait. I want to see what that darkness yeah. is. The elven queen is my other question. So then, okay, so the king drops himself in the sarcophagus, but then he also traps his royal subjects in there as well. So the first campaign is just to release the elven king's subjects, right? And we haven't actually released the elven king yet. But here's my question. Like, why is the elven queen the big bad guy? Like, what did he do to her that he's she's so pissed that she's like, I will not, I will die before I let you in and rescue my husband? Is that the is that her husband, or are we to assume that? See, I'm wondering the same thing. I'm not sure if like she was the queen by marriage, or does she t try to take over the role? That's a hard one. I mean, overall, I mean, the story's thin. It's only a, a couple pages on screen. They just give us a little storybook of just, hey, you know, he's a bad elven king, and he's trapped in the necropolis, and we have yeah. to save their souls. Um, that, that's literally it. Uh, yeah. it. Most of the story is mostly through the interactions, you know, the collaboration with other players that kind of builds a story but that's still not really a story it's a story of our actions towards you know enemies and other obstacles but we don't really know anything about the overall plot of there's no real progression other than just hey let the thing out um it, so it is a little anticlimactic i guess you know yeah yeah but and it's also like well if this was his wife and she's desperately trying to stop everyone from saving him and if she's not the final, final boss, and she's only the boss of the first campaign, then who the heck is going to be beyond that? And why is she so low on the totem pole? I don't know. And why is she so ugly? Like, what, if, is, is the Elven King also that ugly? Because she's, she's not very good looking. You know what? That's a weird one. Because the Elven King only has uh, two arms, according to the picture I saw, and she has right. four. So... <laughs> Yeah. Not sure how the elf question. anatomy works in this universe. I don't know. <laughs> but that is a little weird. I don't know. Yeah, we got to find out this uh, <laughs> elven family tree here because something something's got to mock in their uh, in their lives. I'm not quite sure, but um, <laughs> but in any case, you know, I also am interested. Like, okay, so if that's the elven realm that we go down into, yeah, you know, then we've I think we've got ogres, we've got um, you know, uh, we've got giant. Uh, Trolls, trolls that show up every once in a while and then we've got our four main characters so it's interesting to know like what would the world be like outside of this propolis uh, you know in this dungeon that we are in that, that's kind of interesting as well i doubt we'll ever get there in this game 
uh, this version, but um, it would be interesting to get uh, uh, just a, a glimpse of what is above the surface and what's outside of these, these dungeons. Oh, I think it's, you're right about that. Um, there's a lot of options um, for story fodder. I mean, it's kind of you have to have your own meta story within your head, but I did wish they're a little more explicit. You know, just a few more details. Give us a little more world building, and that way as you interact with other players, you can kind of have a little more role play because this isn't really a role play game. Um, people say, right. hey, it's role playing. You're right. not really playing a role. You're playing a class. Uh, you're playing a part within the game, but you're not really playing a character. You know, I'm not right. an archer character. I'm participating as an archer to get a certain task completed. I, I think that's the one big difference. Um, I, a little more story, mm. maybe that can help. You know, in the back of my head, I could feel like my actions have a little more meaning within the game. Totally, totally, totally. Okay, so let, let's talk about the, these characters that we can play here, because and, I, and I'm very curious to know what your favorite is, because I, I certainly... You know, it's interesting. I started off with one being my favorite and I've now moved and that person is now my least favorite. So it's kind, <laughs> of, it's kind of an interesting trajectory, but we got four main characters here. Right? I feel like there's like two um, that are close range fighters and two that are more far range fighters, right? So we've, yes. got, the, um, we've got the knight or the, the sort of soldier that they call the tank or a bunch of different names for, uh, for her. Uh, the guardian, I guess, is the big name. And she is, uh, she can replay, replenish her armor every time. So she's basically got endless life, like endless sort of health. And she can go in and she can really hit hard. And she has this shield that can protect us. She's like the frontline fighter. Then you've got the, um, and you, you know, and so yeah, his, his, his she's, uh, her um, strength obviously is, is power in close battle, which I guess is the melee, the melee fighting. Ever. Oh yeah, this character is important because there's a lot of yeah. times you realize how soft you are when it comes to getting damage from enemies. You know, if you yeah. play as you know, let's say the sorcerer, and you open a door, well, you might get hit hard. That's a right. nice thing about um, they have these refillable abilities. Um, you might notice like the the armor up on this character. Um, you have a card that has you know like the little double arrow symbol representing it refreshes each turn. So you always have an opportunity to refresh the armor value. So you can open up a door and just kind of wait it out and take a few hits from the bad guys and allow the rest of the team to scoop in. So it's really fun how each role really has a dynamic purpose. Um, and yeah. if other players understand the role, they all could work together and collaborate for, you know, really big wins and really neat combos, you know, between characters yeah. that are available. Totally, totally. So uh, this is definitely a character. I don't think I've ever gone on a campaign without the Guardian. I feel like they're like the one you, one of the ones you need. I don't know. Do you feel that? Have you, have you tried without the Guardian? It's hard because the Guardian is the one that's able to be a little more independent because of that mm. extra shield. I mean, because sometimes right. you have a humongous spider pop out of nowhere and just take some you know, massive damage, and I'll be down if I'm playing any other character, but this one you know, could take a couple big hits and then retaliate. Totally. Yeah, I agree. Um, okay, so then we got the the hunter, right? This is this one is an interesting one because the she is um she has uh arrows, bow and she's she shoots bow and arrow, so she can get um distance uh she can capture you know kill people from very far away where she's still safe and the the interesting thing about her right is that she has two replenishable arrows per turn and each of them have a minimum of three hits damage so you could get six damage on a foe without even getting in the same room as them so i i really i really love her power i don't know how do you feel about the uh about the hunter Oh, the Hunter was one of my favorites from the start. Uh, I, I played the Hunter a few games back to back just for the fact that I love range combat, I love archery, but also I love the pets. You know, this Hunter can bring, yeah. you know, pets from the wild, like a wild dog totally. to help you fight. Um, oh, and also, um, you know, there's a great card. It's like a little bone that you can throw to the hounds, those evil hounds oh, while you're yeah. in the dungeon, and the hounds will become your friend. So I, I think that's the wonderful thing about the Hunter character. You could you know, enhance, I mean, you could have multiple allies join you in the form of, you know, different animals like spiders or wolves, and, you know, they can yeah. really help you score some great points. Totally, yeah. I, I, so that, that, that still is my favorite trick. Uh, for those of you out there who don't want spoilers on tricks, uh, this is going to be a tough one because we're going to, we hope that you want them because we're going to give you some, some tips and tricks because this is my favorite one. Where if you, 
have a bone and you meet a hound in the first level, it will be with you the the entire game. I mean, they just, I feel like I've had one that's lasted for level upon level upon level. On top of that, you can get multiple hounds. So I've had like as many as two hounds <laughs> following me along, which is awesome. I, I love that trick. It was a, it's such a, a great one um, to learn because otherwise the bone is pretty useless, but it becomes almost invaluable when you find out that the hounds uh, love the bones, right? Oh yeah, and they get uh, a lot of damage. Those hounds are tough. You know, they totally. saved my life a couple times. Yeah. The other thing that the the hunter can do is they've got the uh, um, um, hunter's mark, I think it's called, and that would yes. uh, that would in particular, I think I I still am not a hundred percent positive. I feel like when you get to the elven queen and you give her the hunter's mark, she can't become invulnerable. Or if she can become invulnerable, she only it only lasts very, very briefly. Like it doesn't last three turns, it only lasts like one turn. So it's like a really great tool because the problem with the Elven Queen, of course, is that when she becomes invulnerable for multiple turns, you can't do anything except some the other people get spawned and spawned and spawned. And so you get surrounded because you can't kill the, the queen. So I think Hunter's Mark's really invaluable as well. The other one that the hunter can do is the decoy. Uh, and the decoy is another invaluable one where all the villains think that the decoy is what they have to kill. And so they all turn uh, to go and get that. And then you can attack uh, and you're safe for a couple turns. It's a great, great one as well. Oh, yeah. The barrier is fun. You could do some cool tricks with the barrier um, as yeah. well. Um, you know, like the little wood sticks barrier. I believe that's yeah, yeah. also um, another one of the hunter's cards. I, I love it. It's, hey, you know, push comes to shove. I'm going to put some sticks in front of the door and have these monsters beat the sticks while I'm trying to sneak around them to shoot off far off enemies. So it's nice how you do the little combos where the first action, okay, here, let me put down a decoy. Second action, here, I'm going to shoot this direction and you know, maybe blow up a lantern or something like that. Like you could do combinations back to back with those action cards. So much. Yeah. I think it's a great way to interact in the world of the game itself. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, I love that. I love that the hunter is able to summon these beasts and and, and become befriend all of these animals. It's such a great, such a great idea. So I guess this is as that's as far as the RPG element of this game goes, right? It's just like. It's not a personality, but it's like certain traits and skills that uh, they have that others don't. But um, yeah, too bad it couldn't go a little further. But um, yeah, yeah, I agree with you on that one. Yeah. Uh, all right. So this is so the assassin is the enigma, right? This one is like the stealth, the stealth fighter who can um, sneak. They go into sneak mode, and for three turns, no one can see them, and they can like run around and figure out where all the bad guys are, and figure out where all the goodies are. Um, and uh, I noticed actually you uh, taught me a little bit about this character, the assassin. What is the special trick that the assassin could do to get more damage? It's all about the backstabbing. Those <laughs> double blades, you just sneak behind the back of some enemy and go for massive damage. Essentially, it's like getting a critical hit. You're getting double the damage for each one of those. You sneak up behind them, boom. But the hard part is character placement. You know, you have to keep an eye open on are you where you're going to fall in order to get the proper back hit? Because a lot of times you think, oh, I got him on the back, but technically you're to the side or et cetera. So you'll see the damage either go double or go by half if you go you know, a little too ajar left or right. Yeah, so you have to yeah, just keep yeah. in mind, you know, pinpoint the back of that character and boom, you have some huge massive damage. It's yeah, so satisfying. Yeah, I had, I didn't know that, you know, this character was the toughest for me to figure out. And, uh, and, and I guess it's supposed to be that way, right? It's the Enigma character, but I thought that you had some really good strategies with that character. You had, you kind of had her, uh, him. I guess this is a him. There's two guys and two girls. Oh, this is uh, um. Well, with the assassin, the assassin is referred to as they, because right. we don't know anything. Age, gender is all hidden. Yeah, you know, so that makes That's even right. more of an Enigma. That's right. We don't know if it's a guy or a girl. That is absolutely true. Um, the other uh, great. Uh, weapon that this character has is the um, uh, the uh, bomb, the like uh, poison bomb. I think yes, it, I think is so great because it's it splatters the ground with poison, and then you can just get two or three or four or five or six hits on an enemy or a, or a group of enemies. And I find that one also like a, a very valuable tool, especially in the end when you're fighting the Elven Queen, because you can just like trap her in one of her little rooms. 
and poisons poison down there and every turn she gets she's getting hit every time she tries to move in the poison so um that's another great uh skill with this character oh i that's another really fun skills that the combinations you could put together because remember you get throw when those you know the green um you know smoke cloud of poison but it's also able to be ignited um if someone throws like a fireball so right. any of that area that's been you know with the smoke flowing one little fireball and suddenly boom you're going for even massive damage for essentially like you know 10 squares of damage i mean yeah. it's interesting how the grid process works um for a character right. like this where you look at the grid and you can figure out okay where can i get the you know the more advantageous attack or hey how many other characters can i attack with just one toss of a you know of a grenade of, or some lie or some poison I think that's why the assassin's my favorite. Uh, just that you have a lot of different options, and you can yeah. do combinations with other characters to go for massive, massive, an experience. Yeah, it's you know I don't I've never really done the the po uh, lighting the poison on fire. I just let the poison sit there. I haven't tried that yet. I'm gonna have to try. It. So you got you know all the tricks with the, with this with the assassin. You're the ma you're the assassin it master. It was an ex that was an accident, but a happy accident mm. because uh, I also burned myself to death <laughs> that <laughs> round because right, I right, ignited right. it. And, oh no! <laughs> right. The more you learn, yeah. that's the fun part about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's a, that's a really cool character. Okay, so then we got last but not least, we got the sorcerer here, uh, who is another sort of long range attacker because when he gets up close, he's really wimpy. He he punches people, but he only gets like one or two damage. So you got to use his spells get people a little further out and then he's got the zap card that gets replenished but the zap card it, it only hits one damage but it's it stuns people for uh, at least w one round um but a lot of uh, the villains that i really want to kill are often immune to stun so it's like i don't know so the, <laughs> you know th this is the guy i have to admit this was the one that at the beginning of the game was my original favorite. I was like, oh, this is awesome. We got the sorcerer. She's got so many, um, so many different spells, like the fire the fireball spell and uh, a bunch of uh, different ones like that. And I was like, oh, this character's great. But then you discover after a while, they really can't inflict that much damage. And your cards, um, you start losing your cards very quickly. And this character went from my favorite character to my least favorite character over the course of a couple of weeks. And um, and so then what replaced this as my favorite characters, I actually think the hunter is my favorite character. Uh -huh. the, yeah, I feel like the hunter, you can just lean back and you can you can attack from afar and she's got uh, uh, so many cool um, weapons and, and like you said, the animals. So I, I actually feel like um, that's the one that I can I lean to now and I don't want to go on a campaign without the hunter, but um, it used to be the sorcerer. I don't know. What do you think about the sorcerer? The sorcerer is interesting, mostly because of the zap. I, I've been trying to find ways to make the zap ability a little more useful. Um, so yeah. it does help with like you know scary big enemies to at least get a zap in, so at least it won't get a retaliatory action in um, on the next turn. Yeah. But um, the only ability I like of his is the Heaven's Fury, where you just drop you know oh, yeah. all those yeah, like yeah. you know red blades over everything. That's right. a wonderful ability, but it's hard to get. I mean, you have to usually earn right. enough gold to even buy it in the first place. Um, I, I rarely get it in a treasure chest when we pop them open. So, right. I mean, he is more of the weaker character. I do like it when he does the teleport action. That that can help too. Um, teleporting yeah. um, enemies to just get them out of the way. Because sometimes those rooms are just overfilled. I mean, you open one door and suddenly, oh my goodness, there's 12 things in here. And they're all about right. to beat us up. So that at least that one ability can get a large threat to pause or get it out of the way for at least a turn or two. Yeah, the, not the, my you favorite. Know, the thing that, yeah, the thing that I find the zap is probably the most useful for is hitting the uh, lamps or the ice lamp or the fire lamps and just sort of igniting a room on fire from a from a distance. That's really the thing that the zap can do better than anything, I guess. Right? Because uh, you know. 
Um, I think it's satisfying. That that's one thing I could say. <laughs> you know, doing a zap and just especially some rooms uh, because of the randomizer for the dungeons. Some rooms will have like you know three or four lanterns of different kinds. So you hit one of them, you can create this crazy chain effect where almost right. every square is blowing up. So sometimes you can have a happy accident with that zap ability, at least. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, totally. Okay, so you so your favorite is the assassin. Is there another? Who's your second? Who would you have to bring on a campaign besides the assassin? Either the assassin or the hunter. Um, the yeah. assassin. I, I, mostly the reason why I like the assassin is the fact that I, I could just go into stealth and just kind of explore, open up a couple treasure chests, and try to sneak around. Uh, it's just a fun ability. It lets me just you know the surveyor and kind of you know chart out the safe passage or whatever. And then the archer, of course, I love ranged abilities. The range is fun. You get the line of sight, and you you could hit some awesome shots. It's just so much fun yeah. to just go. Up, I got the bad guy from ten squares away, or whatever. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, I, yeah, it's funny. Uh, now that I think about, you know, you're talking about RPG. Remember when we played the first game? We played the um, the person who was playing the assassin didn't speak, and we were like, "Oh, his microphone's broken. Maybe he was role playing." Whoa, you might be right. <laughs> <laughs> Scary, deadly like, enigma. <laughs> yeah, he or she was taking it very seriously. Like, I will be the enigma behind the assassin, and I'm going to role play. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> um. All right. So gameplay. Um. So yeah. What do you What do you feel about the the gameplay? It's it, it, you really are playing a board game. How How do you feel about that? Mm I enjoyed the board game feel. Um, rolling the die um, felt very natural. The fact I just had this one big die roll. I also loved the fact that I could easily move around the board. You know, when you play a board game in real life, you can't zoom in, um, you know, extremely close to look at the miniatures and characters. In this game, I could pull it right onto my lap, or even better, I could lift the entire board and just put it right on eye view. So I like that aspect of the gameplay. I could get the perfect view, also just for really cool cinematic moments. Um, I would, you know, kind of get the view just right, and then I'll toss a card out to do a really cool damage-based attack, and hey, see some great animations. So overall, it, it had that feel, the immersion, the fact that I could, you know, literally, you know, lean on the table and kind of peek up or down walk around the table um that's another interesting feature if you're playing standing um you have that virtual tabletop you can walk around it which also felt extremely immersive um, i haven't had that feeling yet in my oculus until i played this game this gave me that feeling of hey i'm really here and i'm playing with a couple friends yeah so how how often do you go down on an eye level view and how good is eye level view I only do eye level view mostly for the coolness. It's just mm -hmm. dynamic because the animation is really fascinating. When you see the character just get that action out that you like, that's mostly it. Um, the particle effects are really great. Um, I, I just love the, the fine details. I mean, yeah, you get too close, you know, they're not the most detailed models within the game, but they're detailed and cartoony enough that it works perfectly for Oculus Quest. So oh, yeah, so the you know that's interesting. I've never, I've I haven't found that going down into eye level. I've never found a satisfying view down there. Like I wish this is actually my biggest crit uh, criticism of the game is that I wish you could press like the B button and zoom into the character, and you could see from the eyes of the character, and then you could and then you could play out your action, and then you could press B button again and zoom back out to like God's eye view or or whatever. I feel like. Obviously, that's asking a lot. That would require some major graphics and all of that kind of stuff. But I feel like that's the power of VR, right? Is like the fact that you are the character. You are you're not sort of looking down on the character. You're in it. So I feel like you know games like The Last of Us and a lot of video games. You have that option where you could go to a third person view. You could zoom into the character's view. Um, I think even in Saints and Sinners: Walking Dead, you could do that, right? Mm, I don't remember doing any third person. Um, I don't remember that option popping no. up. Yeah, maybe um, not. I, I, yeah, I'm trying to, yeah. 
Yeah. But I do. It, it, it is always weird with switching. Some games, it's always an awkward switch between first person and third person. So it's hard mm. to tell. I did. I do wish that there was a few action buttons to change your view because dragging the table, you know, in real mm. life, I wouldn't pick up the table and try to, you know, tilt it and lift it. So I think a few shortcuts, even like a first person sh view sh shortcut will definitely be worth it. Because I mean, even if you look at this, you know, the image that we have up here, I mean, to see that, you know, dynamic explosion on top of that spider when I'm shooting zap at it, that would be, I mean, actually, that's a fireball card. I mean, that, that would be wonderful to see first person. So who knows? I mean, maybe an update yeah. or two. Or even, yeah, or even like at older games where it was like when you do your kill move, it, it zooms into like the, 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 the level of the playing field and you can see, you could like go with the fireball. I mean, that would be incredible. Obviously, that's expensive stuff to be able to develop. But yeah, I just feel like, you know, this is the first game that I've played that you're outside of the characters. Um, so it's sort of, in a way, it, it, it's a throwback to older games, but it, that's the one where it's like, well, they could have updated it maybe and make us really feel like we are walking through this dungeon, but we don't really feel like that. And that's my only, my only real criticism because you know, I do know that obviously they're going to be building these new campaigns and the, the three levels is only temporary, but this is an element that may not be temporary, right? <laughs> it might be around for a while, for forever. Well, that's a good point. Uh, when it comes to the gameplay, one other thing I thought was missing was Dungeon Master's role. One mm. thing I thoroughly enjoyed when I was a kid was to build my own dungeons and set traps and, you know, put different hazards in and hide enemies in different areas. I, mm. I know that it's an automated, you know, it's a randomization system that they use to create the levels, but I do wish they had a mode for a dungeon master, someone to actually use the same tools to drag and drop to create their own, you know, dark evil dungeon. Cause it's kind of fun to say, set up 20 traps for my best friends. Let's see how they get through this. So if there was a means of adding a fifth player as that designer role, that would definitely push this game over the top. That is a very cool idea. I love that idea. That that's uh we'll have to get the the developers on the phone. Get them on the hey, Jonathan, they need to hire you. What's uh. up? <laughs> no, that's that's a great idea. That would be so much fun. You're right. Cuz it does feel like this is like when we got together um so we had a game that we uh we got recorded and released. It's on Twitter. You can watch it. So I had a previous episode where I had, had on VR Verdict. And so we played with the two guys from VR Verdict. And um, that was that was super uh, fun to do. But just imagine, and it felt like a game night. Like it felt like, okay, we're going to like get together with some friends. We're going to have this game night and we're going to be in this virtual uh, rec room in our basements. And that was super cool. But you're right. There needs to get, having the dungeon master would be that final cherry on top absolutely that would be so fun then and you can each take turns kind of like being the dungeon master or something like that totally yeah oh yeah yeah well, um, overall you know, i loved I... Oh, oh, go ahead oh well i was just thinking just in terms of just the, the the tactile nature of um you know pinching and picking up your miniatures um and also the fact that you could pick up the enemies to get more information about them um i did enjoy that because it kind of reminded me oh back in the day you had to open up a rule book and flip through to find okay what does this bad guy do but the fact i could just lift him up and get more information um it, it was nice i got that you know it helped us strategize better as well because sometimes mm -hmm. you throw something you realize oh this character this enemy is immune to this card and when i first started playing i had no clues i'll just you know hey i'm gonna make this character panic oh it doesn't panic it because it's immune to it so it was kind of nice after i learned oh i could just pick them up and learn more and that was totally. during a game session with the with the other folks i mean the vr yep. verdict guys you know yep. they they were given tips just like other folks so that's the fun thing about this game is that every gameplay session you get to learn from others you know of more experienced players will kind of give you a couple fun tips and create combinations so overall i i the social aspect of it is what i love the most totally the social vr aspect where you're multiplayer you're hanging out you're in a rec room in the 80s you're kind of just like geeking out on this game and like helping each other and figuring out how to do these campaigns together yeah it's it's, it's that's the best part about it i mean the only other game that i've played that's so um so good with social is probably um What's I don't even remember what it's called. It's like that sports game 
where you uh, you shoot the, the it's like a, you shoot these Tron like discs into the net. Oh, Echo VR. Echo. Echo, Echo that, VR. Yeah. It's Echo like VR is the golf. other one. Yeah, Echo VR is the other one where it's like that's a really good multiplayer uh, game where you're you're playing with just random people who come in and some of them are so good and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, this one is the second uh, second best um, or you know in that field for sure. Oh yeah, and I have to give props to the VR community because when it comes to the community interactions, you know, different games have different levels of toxicity. I have had a great mm -hmm. time playing with absolutely random folks who have been funny, sweet, you know, just, uh, just normal guys and girls and just fun people who want to interact and play a game. It felt like it was fast friends. You know, I'm in a room by myself and then suddenly three other folks jump in and just start playing together and collaborating. Um, I haven't had a game where someone didn't want to work together for a common goal, which I found fascinating. I'm like, these are complete strangers and we're, you know, like, hey, I'm going to save you. Don't worry. Just hold on for one more turn. I'm going to go and revive you because you just got knocked down. It, it felt like this is a community game and whatever it is, um, they're doing everything right so far because I've had a very pleasant experience each game session with random people. Yeah, that's a really good point because Echo VR, I had people like humping my face and like doing weird stuff with my avatars <laughs> and like I get maybe it's because it's a competitive game and so you're taunting the other players and you're kind of and then you you come in and you're you don't have to commit to a very long game whereas this is like a two and a half hour long campaign with with people that have to work on your team against these other orcs and warlords and things like that. Whereas Echo VR is like you're in and out in like a five to ten minute game. You don't really have to create any kind of loyalty. Plus you're you're fight you're you're competing in a sports arena against another team and they're gonna be taunting you and like flipping you off and trying to hump your face and do whatever. That's a really good point though. That this was a very non-toxic uh environment. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, all right. So, uh, last one before we get to, uh, uh, well, we got a few, if, a few tips and trips maybe, but the style, we sort of talked about the style. I think it's really cool. It's, 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 I'm going to try to get down into first person view a little bit more because I've been sort of taking God's eye view more frequently. Um, but it's, it's got a great style when you get right in there. I just found it gets a little pixely when you get too close. Is that, is that your experience? Yeah, there, there's a limit because I mean, there are miniatures. Um, I, I, when I, I play miniature games in real life, and the one thing about painting miniatures, we call it like the three foot rule, where, hey, three feet away, this miniature looks great. You pick it up and look okay. at it nice and close, you see all the goop and the globs and all the mistakes. That's how it kind of felt. So I didn't mind it because it reminds me of how my poorly painted miniatures look when I get too close to them. But hey, okay. three feet, they look awesome. So I, I'll give him a pass for that. It reminded me of my real world experience. <laughs> right. Uh, what What do you feel about um? Have you been Have you been uh getting um these skins and things like that? Have you Yeah. Have you got into that? Um, <laughs> kind of changes things a little bit. I'm I'm only like halfway through the skins. There's a lot of skins to get. You can get so you can get different types of armor for your guys. You can get uh, different uh, uh, plates uh, that they stand on. Um, and you can get different types of dye. dye. Uh, you can get red dye and leather dye and all that kind of stuff. Have you? How far have you gotten with the that stuff? I've only have a handful of unlockables. I mean, because yeah. the thing is, I played a lot of um, solo skirmishes as well. Mm -hmm. So that's the funny thing. I played kind of fifty-fifty solo skirmishes by myself with the three characters just for practice, and then group games. So the thing is, your experience points. I believe they only accumulate mostly from the regular games. So I got some extra dice. Um, you know, I, I love um, you know, like the multicolored ones. Like I have this really cool kind of jade looking dice. Mm -hmm. And I do love the, the costumes. And I like the fact that you're earning these costumes. It's not some kind of, mm -hmm. you know, um, downloadable content scheme where I have to pay $4.99 to, you know, just get a mustache right. for my character. Mm -hmm. I, I do love the fact that I earn it. You know, I'm playing, I'm co I'm collaborating, I'm, you know, using the right cards, I'm collecting enough gold. And then, yeah, I, I love the fact even the, bla the base plates are changeable in different styles. It, it makes it feel more unique. It makes me want to almost, you know, digitally paint my own little miniatures almost. I mean. Yeah, I wonder if it would add to it if they did it like Echo VR. Because in Echo VR, when you get certain types of, um, skins it actually increases your gameplay 
So it changes the way you can play the game and it gives you extra powers. I wonder if that would add to it where it's like, oh, you get an extra card, you get a bonus card because you have this like type of skin or something like that. Um, yeah. Maybe it would make it too uneven and too unfair. I don't know, but um, that might be something that uh, would be kind of interesting. Yeah, as long as there's balance, you know, because I, yeah. I don't like games that feel like people are paying to win. Right, I, know I don't want right. someone to, you know, pay for experience and get the coolest skin that gives you bonuses. But if it's earned through gameplay and they find a way to keep the levels right, so other players that might be a little higher level will play together. I'm not really sure how the system works right now when it comes to pairing players, you know, because I'm not really sure if it's based on experience points or if it's just totally random, but that would be something that could be helpful. So the power players can play together and the beginners can play together or even friendly right. versus more competitive matches. Um, if they have mm. more choices or at least data so we know how we're getting connected, I, I think that would make it a little more fulfilling. Totally, totally, yeah. Well, cool. um, all right. So tips and tricks. So this is where we get to do the spoilers, whatever, whatever we got. Um, so we, we we said the bone one. The bone one's got to be my favorite hack that we we uh, found so far. Um, I think there was. I think was it you also that maybe brought up the one. How do you defeat the blob? Yes. Um, you can have a jar of lye and just toss it out yeah. the the slime blob, and it'll just melt down. Yeah, that was a great also, trick because a, a blob can have like 15, 16 health and you in one swipe of lie, they just dissolve to nothing. It's from 15 to zero. So it's like a really great one because not only are they 15 health, but they spawn little slimes that come and get you all the time and they leave their trail on the ground. So to get rid of them in one swoop is so, uh, so powerful. And also those little slimes can combine again to make another big slime. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's another scary one that can happen where you think, hey, just ignore that little thing. It's no big deal. Suddenly, oh, two of them combine and now we have another massive threat and I just used my last thing of lie, which has happened a couple of times. Nice. Um, all right, so any other any other big tips or tricks that you've learned along the way? Well, it's mostly about building combinations between each player, mm -hmm. but also knowing your line of sight. Um, mm -hmm. One thing about the game, one critique, um, you know, especially for new players, it is a little hard to gauge line of sight. You know, usually, mm -hmm. you know, if you're playing on tabletop, hey, I could just do my eye view. You know, I'll just kind of lean right. down at the table and what I see I could hit. But sometimes in the game, what I think I could see, I can't hit. But somehow with the bad guys, I saw those arrows can go around corners sometimes and still hit me. So it's it's hard to tell. It seems like the bad guys are playing by a different set of rules. But yeah, um, totally. knowing how to get the line of sight just right can save the day. Right. Yeah, and I think also um, the, the order in which you kill your enemies, like you should seek out the enemies that can spawn other enemies. Because it, it, if you got like a a, a sort of elven chieftain or something like that and he spawns like all of these well, i guess it's the priests right the priests are the ones that yes. spawn the other ones so it's like those ones you got to get rid of because they can summon other ogres or whatever to come at you and uh, even though the ones that they summon are always the weakest right so they always get panicked the most easily but still it's just annoying to have a room full of five of them when you could have just killed the one i mean archers i think uh are getting rid of them getting rid of the long range attackers also helps I don't know about you, but I usually leave the um, those weird ghoul-like things that teleport all the bad guys, because, but they never hit you, they never hurt you. They just teleport bad guys in to hurt you. I usually leave them alone because, if it, you know, they don't hurt you, so you can just let them sit around and and take care of all the other bad guys who can cause uh, damage to you first. I sort of find that helpful. Um, the oh, one cool good trick one. I, I yeah, the one cool trick I learned was that. If you charm a, a necromancer, it also charms all of the spawns that necromancer has brought back from the dead. So then you can get like an army of bad guys to fight for you. Yeah, I it's love really cool. that effect. Creating a bunch yeah. of allies. Um, that yeah. was an accident. The, the first time I saw yeah. that happen was we were playing in the game and everyone, it was the first time we've all experienced it. So it was a blast. We all yelled like, oh my goodness, what just happened? That was cool. Yeah. Like yeah, yeah, those yeah. wow moments that are built into this game are very organic. Um, but really. one other tip I really enjoyed when, you know, when it comes to opening doors, I it always feels like I put the wrong guy in. Cause remember the assassin, it, you could, 
traverse different areas under stealth, right. but you know, it's all about that placement, you know, opening up a door and being at the wrong angle. Once again, line of sight. Um, right. it, I've been swamped because, Hey, I'm at the side of the door. No one can hurt me. No, they will. So that's why having the guardian as that doorkeeper can really save the day. Just, Hey, have the guardian open a door, help do a little sweep and then kind of sneak right. your assassin behind everything. Um, a lot of times how the doorways are set up, you could have one person at the main door to kind of block and, you know, start fighting and then have your assassin sneak around behind all the enemies while they're busy you know, fighting. So that, that's always totally. a great tip, you know, use someone to distract and use someone to attack. Totally. Yeah, no, for sure. If you, and if you have a decoy, you can do it even, even better. That, that oh, yeah, I doubly. usually save. Yeah, doubly. Exactly. Um, yeah, the, the, the other thing that I find really helpful, I find ballast like ballast or, um, there's one other one that the guardian can get that they become like just like uh they just help you so much because it's like you've got another person on your turn who can kill all the bad guys so i i think those things are really helpful and also getting an elemental creating an elemental putting them on your side is super uh cool as well so the more allies you can have the the better campaign's going to be for sure um oh it's so fun to go to the third dungeon like that you know a whole bunch of allies <laughs> kind of hey we have five folks helping us that, that's always a blast yeah well that's the, you know this is i guess the other criticism is that i actually feel like the elven queen is pretty easy <laughs> you know getting to her is harder but beating her is not a hard it's not so hard that it makes me feel satisfied like i know that this is only campaign one so i'm waiting for the next one but i feel like but the the um, level that the Elven Queen is in only has certain rooms, and she seems to often gets trapped in a corner. You can just like blockade the door, and you could put some poison on the ground, and you can get like healing wards and ballast and people to fight for you. All you need to do with the archer is to take out the unseen or the unheard. Which is it? The one that uh, makes her invulnerable. Yes. I think it's the un hey. is it the unseen? I think it's, yeah, you know, unseen or unheard. Yeah. You just want to put a little, yeah, the bubble effect on the invulnerability. But yeah. also with that, that's one of my primary issues. The invulnerability, after you learn how it works with the with the queen, well, it's easier to repeat it over and over again. It almost reminds me of an old Nintendo game, like, you know, 16-bit, 18-bit era, when it's very, very hard the first time. But after you learn the patterns and the tricks... Yeah it's not as hard anymore so exactly. yeah i feel like there's less strategy in future games but the moment there's enough new players that come in that they're still you know shocked and surprised by you know, this humongous creature so at least you know you have that experience you know the less familiar players might panic or make a wrong move so at least you have to account for that so that adds a little randomization beyond the basic totally totally looks like we had uh friend over here uh fn avery was trying to try to get on stage how's it going fn <laughs> avery hey how y'all doing I'm, I'm new to this thing i'm sorry what's up have you are you a dmo player i don't even know what that is i'm sorry guys I'm he's busy. like what's dmo <laughs> you're really quiet for some reason can you hear him oh yeah I'm having problems oh, with my me. audio today. Oh, there we go. Hey, how's it going? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. I'm I'm new to this thing. I'm sorry. I just downloaded this thing. <laughs> no problem. Well, that's all no good. Problem. That's the fun part. Exactly. You just explored. You just hopped into our uh, our podcast show. We're talking about Demio. Okay. Welcome. If you haven't well, played it. It's uh. It's a really addictive uh, role, uh, role-playing game, fantasy game for your Oculus. So okay. we're just about to give our final review here. Wow! 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 <laughs> That's right. It's WoW score time. So that means <laughs> Ben Wow's is like this game is the most incredible game I've ever played. Zero Wow's is like what the hell did I just waste my time doing? Uh, Wow, score! What do you give it? Uh, Futurosity. I am curious. Is a wait. Let's I'll just remind each other because this is where it gets challenging, though, because we did The Walking Dead, and I gave you. What did you? I gave it eight and a half. You gave it eight. 
So now we yes. have to, that's always going to be the the gauge, right? Is like, did you like it more than Walking Dead or less than Walking Dead? So I'm very curious to hear. Oh, now that's a hard one. Uh, I <laughs> think I'm going to, I'll think in terms of genre, you know, so, mm. you know, as far okay. as, um, you know, board games, I'm going to think in terms of just board game wise, I would give this an eight and a half in its current form. Um, mostly because of the social VR aspects and the immersive dice rolling and moving my miniatures around. I mean, it's a lot of fun, but there's enough missing that, you know, I'll be honest, when I first beat it, I kind of questioned the buying price. But then when I looked right. online, I realized, okay, there's more right. content coming. It, it kind of satiated my needs for a little bit. I realized, okay, there's more to come. I believe in these guys. They, they seem like they have a great community. Um, the more I look at it, them, the resolution team that created this game, I realized, hey, you know, quality content creators, I believe that they're going to pull off some amazing stuff. But at the moment, I'll say it's an eight with a lot of potential to be a nine or a 10. Got it, got it, got it. Okay, so then if, so you gave it the same score as Walking Dead. Yeah, I would give it, it's a, it's a fun VR experience. As far as, you know, immersion, of course, you know, Walking Dead offered a lot more. You know, I was able to play a right. role. But within this game, just saying, well, as far as the VR experience, how many wows I had and how many moments I was like, wow, this is amazing. Right. I, I would count those. I, I, I think I had at least eight the first game. Just like, whoa, right. oh, cool. I, right. I count those as points. Okay, so then here, here's the tiebreaker. You have a friend who can only ever play one of these games. Which one do you give them? Which one do you well, recommend to them? For universal appeal and for just getting the Oculus experience, I would give them Walking Dead. Um, just because I say, hey, if you want to feel the VR right. experience, right. Um, the standalone experience, and go through an adventure, especially for a person that's used to you know, paying $60 for a regular full-length game, something like Walking Dead will definitely give them a, a very full experience for the price. Something like this, you know, they're a first-time VR user, I have to double check and see, are you an enthusiast? You know, are you interested in mm. role-playing games and miniatures? Uh, you have to ask a couple more questions before recommending Demio, especially people that may not like the social aspect. They don't want to interact with strangers as much, or they don't have a, a group that they right. want, you know, a gaming group. So it, you, I would ask more questions before I tell someone to get Demio. But for me, I love it. I know there's great potential, but in its current form, and it's it's almost there. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. I think so. I think that the the I, I'm, I found it super addictive. I totally just kept playing and playing and wanting to beat it. I loved playing with other people. Um, I loved uh, I love fantasy kind of, you know, wizards and guardians and all that or I love all that stuff. So I totally dug that. But the detractors are that it, it certainly at this mo po moment in time feels anticlimactic. It's like, oh, wait, I just beat the game. That was it. That's like three levels. Whereas like Walking Dead has like eight levels at least. I don't know, 10 maybe. Um, also, the fact that you're not immersed in a character, seeing it from their point of view, you're right. It doesn't quite um, use all of the uh, empathy machine. Uh, it, you know, immersion that a game like The Walking Dead does where you are a character that people are interacting with and talking to and you're following through a world in a plot. Um, you know, it's interesting because if I think about how many hours I probably played The Walking Dead in this one, it, the interesting thing is that um, Walking Dead, once you beat it once, I don't think I will play it again. I've got, I made it all the way through. I don't know. I know you did. You played it multiple times, right? Yeah. So that. So for me, I think that was it because I think I, I, I went through it once and I was totally fine. Um, but this game, I could see myself continually going back to because I may want to play with some friends or I may want to try out some kind of an, a new strategy or something like that. So I, in the end, am going to give it an 8.7. 8.7. <laughs> <laughs> I Slightly higher than mine. <laughs> yeah, slightly higher than yours and slightly higher than Walking Dead. But I know that The Walking Dead gives you so much more, but for some reason, it just hits a sweet spot for me. And I'm just like, I want to keep playing it, even though uh, I've played in the same levels over and over again. 
there's sort of different strategies you can try. There's different characters you can play with. There, you could play multiplayer mode and get some tips from other people. Um, and so I don't know. I I think this one gives me it gives a slight edge over The Walking Dead. Although I, I'm almost embarrassed to say because Walking Dead is a true VR immersive experience where you're going through a world and there's so much more to offer and it was probably so much more difficult to develop. Um, so they're both they're both great, but uh, I'm gonna give this one a slight edge. I totally know where you're coming from with that. No, you're right. There's something fun about you know having a game with a couple friends, and I think the social aspect of this is what's going to give this game some legs, you know, because we have updates coming in the future, and the social aspects will get people coming back. Uh, the replayability is it's a board game. It feels like hey, I want to pull a game off the shelf, put it on the table, and play with some friends. Uh, I think board games in VR, we need more of this. Um, mm -hmm. We definitely need. You know, I mean, even the classic games like Monopoly and et cetera. I mean, this is the future because, hey, everyone, friends move to different areas. Friends are across the world. Hey, why not just sit down at a little virtual table, throw some dice and have fun? Um, so I, totally. this is a enjoyable game. Very enjoyable. Totally. And definitely for Walking Dead, I bet I'm going to put more hours into this in a few more days than I put in all of Walking Dead. Mm, totally. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, uh, that's, uh, that's what we have to say about that. So thank you for teleporting in to this worldcast of Simulation Nation. Whether you are with us in virtual reality or 2D, listen to the podcast a week from now on Spotify or iTunes. And remember to subscribe to our Instagram at The Simulation Nation, Twitter at SimNationVR, Facebook and Discord. And join us tomorrow, actually, as we have our third most of all space episodes where we talk to the ubiquitous alt person behind alt stage events here in all space until then a plug my friend all right